I was sharing on Sunday night, um, um, I'm going through John 14, 15, 16, 17, just what's there. Um, you know, when uh, before I read John 14, 15 to 28 and bring a few points out, out of that, um, I used to like Marks and Spencer's chicken in white wine sauce. I'm list, this is all linked to what I'm talking about. But I used to, when I was single, living on my own 20, 30 years ago, before I met my wife, and I'd just open it up, tip it in a saucepan. That's nice. But then I'd, I'd, I'd modify it a little bit, because my man, I, you've got to chuck some butter in. I mean, I chuck butter in everything. So you've got to chuck some butter in. Then you've got to put a, maybe a bit of sugar in, and then a, a, after a while, maybe some milk sometimes. And after a while, it just looked absolutely horrible. So I thought, why don't I just keep to the original recipe? And w it's like that with the Bible. Just read what's there. Now, I, I don't have a daily devotional aid. There's nothing wrong with it. For those of you who read them, that's fine. But I'll read through the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark, Romans, Acts, Psalms, things like that, as my devotional aid. And I, I just like to read what's there without chucking any butter in. Because quite often, you can have somebody who will stand here who will speak on grace or prophecy or whatever, and he, he will pre preach something, they will preach something, somebody else will preach it, and it might be three different things. Nothing wrong with topical preaching. It's good. We need it. Um, but I, I, I like to preach what is there. By the way, those of you watching on YouTube, welcome. Good to see you. And, and it's really nice that you can join us. And if you do want to come down um, at any point, let us know on a Sunday night. We're getting busy right now, but we will open up Sunday mornings at some point. So just remember that I'm actually on, online. So good to see you, and I hope you enjoy it tonight as well. And by the way, you've probably got a cup of tea with you, whereas we tonight obviously haven't, but that's fine. We've got the atmosphere. It's like if you're at Wembley Stadium, you get the atmosphere, or, or St Mary's, whereas being at home is different. I want to read from John 14, 15 to 28, and then I um, encourage you what, what, what Jesus is teaching us here. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. That on its own is brilliant. We could just stop there. He's saying, I will give you an advocate. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be with you, will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keep them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will be loved by them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, so that's the other one, there's, two, there's lesser Judas, said, Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I've spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything I have said to you. See, the Holy Spirit will teach us all things. I mean, that sounds good, doesn't it? That means, you know, I've not got to have a degree at Oxford um, uh, in, in Bible studies to be even looked at by God. The Holy Spirit will teach you, Brian, you, Mary, you, Mike, all of you, all things about your future, about your life. Uh, goodness knows what he's going to teach you, but he loves you and he'll tell you secrets he hasn't told me. Peace I leave with you, verse 27. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. You've heard me say I'm going away. I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you will be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold of me, but he comes so that my fo the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. I'm not going to mention everything in there, just a, a few points to uh, encourage you. That's the Gospel of John. So there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and Luke uh, talk about the whole of Jesus' life and mention his birth. You get the Christmas story. Good evening, nice to see you. Or should I say good morning? No, good, good evening. <laughs> um, 
And uh, you get the Christmas story um, in both Matthew and Luke. Um, but John and Mark are smaller, a smaller. I was actually sitting there, it's fine. Stay, 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 stay. Because no one's sitting there, so I can sit there now. Um, um, but the Gospels uh, talk about the life of Jesus. All the truth, just from the point of view of four different people, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in this particular bit, Jesus has given them a hint that his life will soon end. You know, at the age of 30, um, he became, he, he was baptised, filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus was baptised. Isn't that incredible? Filled with the Holy Spirit and had a ministry going through, we think, between three and three and a half years. And then he was executed at age 33. Now, as you see it on Jesus of Nazareth, and he's up there with his arms out and he's looking down at you, it probably wasn't like that. He was absolutely emaciated, like something you would see in the back of a butcher's lorry and sacrificed. He could hardly breathe, hardly speak. His final words, he was sacrificed big time. And he was sacrificed so that you could be forgiven for every single thing you have done wrong. I can, I can run with that. I don't know about you, but that sounds good to me. But right at the beginning, he talks about the Holy Spirit. He's saying right here, and I mentioned this uh, uh, last week, the Holy Spirit is saying, is saying, look, having me with you is good, and you know about God the Father from the, whole, the Old Testament, but here I am, I am the Holy Spirit. You've not got to be perfect to have the Holy Spirit dwell in you, because if you have faith in Jesus, you are, you are perfect anyway. In fact, God the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. It's incredible, isn't it? Isn't that brilliant? So the Holy Spirit is there to, to, to dwell in you and to help you through the very private and very individual life that you have, which is different to your life and your life and my life. And he, the Holy Spirit is there and he will take you where he wants to take you. He will work with you. He will remind you that God's forgiven you. He will remind you that there is a plan for your life. You may see miracles in your life or you may see not, but either way, he will work with you however he wants to. But without God, he says it in verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. Without God, we are orphans. People say to me, I can't make it through the day. And I just say to people, you're not supposed to be able to make it through the day. I'm really depressed. That's, that's normal. You're supposed, you're, supposed to be, you're supposed to feel like an absolute idiot. But with Jesus in your life, you can make it through the day. Now see, I, I've said this from this pulpit before. I'm a complete and total loser and a waste of space from day one. However, with Jesus, I'm everything. Because he's forgiven me, he's given me a plan, he's my, he's my righteousness, he's my problem solver, and he's my reason for living. And I'm living for him. And, 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 and that, is, that is brilliant. And thankfully, I'm trying my very, very best to follow the plan that he has got for my life. I won't leave you as orphans. We can't be... The, but how you, some of you might think, well, how can I have this communion with God as my father? Because some of you are thinking now, yes, he won't leave us as orphans. But you might think, I don't feel good enough. I don't feel good enough to, uh, to commune with him. Well, that's why I've got that cross there to remind us how good um, we are when Jesus is with us. We have the cross of Jesus Christ and and how God works with you is beautiful and is wonderful I had an uh, you see just at the time you, you you actually you actually need him he'll be there for you I remember um, about 1999 somewhere about 20 23 22 years ago uh, from the church we were at in Guernsey I went on a, a missions trip to the Philippines and I've been a few times. And on this particular case, we were coming back overnight on this overnight boat from Mindanao, the southernmost island in the Philippines, to a place called Cebu. We were then going to stay there and get a, a get a plane back to Hong Kong and, and come back. And we'd been in it's similar to Swaziland, although different climate, different culture, but a, a, a sort of a developing area of the world. Um, and 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 so I was there on this boat, and I just felt so low completely. Uh, there were a group of people who'd left, left their daughter behind, so they wanted to be together on the boat, on this big ship. They'd been on the, on the, on the missions team. And, I was, and, and, and so I was just on the, on the top of the actual deck, sitting there, watching the, watching the port go, feeling so lonely and so low. 
I'm thinking there's nobody here who knows me on this on this part of the ship. Nobody can see me speak English. Speak English. And a Filipino man walked past me. He says, "Oh, you want a coffee?" He says, "Yeah." He says, "This machine here." Oh, brilliant! We sat there and talked. And he says, "Where are you from originally?" I said, "Well, I'm actually from the Midlands, a place called Derby." Oh, in England, I know that. Blah 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 blah. I had a lovely conversation with him. I'm looking back, thinking, "You weren't from this earth, were you?" You know, I just think, "Wasn't that guy an angel?" I don't know, but God put him there, and he seemed very familiar with my strange accent. And he talked to me about all kinds of things. He said, where have you been? I've been to Minda now, working with an orphanage run by a church. Oh, lovely. I've, I've heard of that. Never been. And I just think that sometimes, via his Holy Spirit, God will put with you just what you need. And you probably cannot tell me what you need. And I can never give it you. I can never give I haven't got the brains or the intellect or the, the righteousness to give you what you need every time, but the Holy Spirit has, and that is good. And while you're condemning yourself, he reminds you that the cross is there. But he goes on this bit. Now, this little bit might seem a bit difficult because he goes down, verse 21, and he wants to remind them about holiness all the time. So he says things like this. Whoever has my commands, verse 21, and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me. Is, is there any way we can stop that? We can't stop it, can we, really? It's very, no, we, we've got to have the, the, the thingy open. Sorry. Um, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. And he, he gives a reminder. This is not condemning us, but Jesus reminds us that the only outward way to tell if somebody is a follower of Jesus is by their fruit. James 1, 26 to 27 says, those who consider themselves religious, so, so I'm a Christian, you see. God's completely saved me and full of the Holy Spirit. What do I now do on a Monday morning? It was a great service on a Sunday and Joe Bloggs has preached and we've had all this worship. What do I do on a Monday? And he's reminding me, he says, look, um, keep a tight rein on your tongue, verse 26. And religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. In other words, just treat other people n normally. Tr treat other people um, as, though, as though they were you. Look after people. Love, just care, care for other people. I think I shared on, on the, the Facebook broadcast earlier or somewhere that I was in Aldi the other day and got, I had a revelation from God. Like, like there's nothing ever. I mean, this is incredible. I'm, I'm in Aldi, and I was getting some shopping um, for whatever we need. And there's a man in there who was elderly, pushing a trolley round with rather scruffy clothes. And he had another younger man with him who looked probably like his carer. Both of them looked like very, 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 very humble people. You know, Probably, I would imagine, almost certainly the, the elderly man probably wasn't married or in a relationship. The carers were very, very simple people. Not the sort of people who could stand up here. They'd probably be terrified to go anywhere near a church. And I heard one of them say to the other one, oh, where's the corned beef? And I just happened to see the corned beef. I said, here's the corned beef. He said, oh, thank you very much, thank you. But he really almost scared that somebody else had spoke to him. And God said to me, don't forget people like that. Because it's, it, God said to me, that it's taken me years to be able to have the confidence to do this. And, and then we've got to, the orphans and the widows, he's saying, look, yes, you're saved. Yes, the Holy Spirit is there to help you, and I love you. But don't forget those people who were are like how you once were. I used to go out and witness on the streets of Romsey, and some of us used to. And I'd, I'd kind of look out for the people that, the world would consider normal or rich or families or whatever. And quite often, it was like God would say to me inside, don't speak to people like that. Just speak to hum They're important. But just go and ha chat to that elderly person sat down on the bench there. Or go and chat to this person. The sort of people who are to totally rejected. See, because it says Jesus was despised and rejected in society. So, in a sense, this is what he's calling us to do. You're calling I shared this morning on YouTube about, um, you know, Palm Sunday. Everyone waved the branches as Jesus came in. But then when Jesus went off to do, to do other things, like turn the table temples over, we, we always think that we've got to do that as well, stand up for things in society, and we have. But he also wants us to look after the humble 
people as well. And he goes down then to another bit of great teaching, verse 25 to 26. And he says this, All this I've spoken with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. I mentioned that uh, earlier. Um, and I think, it, 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 you know, don't forget, it is possible as a Christian to, to feel God's presence. There are certain Christian denominations who say that, you know, God only speaks through the Bible. Well, if that's the case, the Bible didn't exist for the first 300 years after the life of Jesus because it was, it was in separate books and they put it together in 325, where it was in separate books before and separate letters. So, of course, they have the, of course the Holy Spirit spoke to them and the Holy Spirit can speak to you. And the presence of God can absolutely speak to you and you, you, you can be, he can be felt close by and then he goes on finally towards the end to say this that in me in christ you are allowed to have peace you can have peace you're allowed to have peace you are allowed to um to experience peace I'm, i mean some i mean in terms of peace in our minds and the whole area of of, of, of mental illness and stuff is a, is a minefield which I don't think you can get one person here who could tell you all about it in 10 years, and the, the biggest professor or the biggest theologian. It's just a minefield. But what I have discovered in my life is that whatever we're going through, good or bad, it is possible to have peace. Because he's saying now, he knows, they know that he's going to die. And after a while, they dragged him off after a while, and they, and they crucified him, and he was, he was executed for their sins, uh, for, for, for everyone's sins. They know that you know rose again three days later and the church started and you go for the book of acts and all the letters at the end and everything and it's brilliant it's great but he seemed to have peace himself because he knew he knew jesus he knew he knew god himself and he's saying you can have peace yourself you are allowed to have peace absolutely allowed to have peace you're allowed to have peace inside that comes from the holy spirit you don't have to worry you don't have to fear that moment when you wake up at four or five in the morning and, and some people experience this and fear just goes bang on top of you. You can say, well, actually, OK, I'm aware that that's here. I'm not a spiritual giant that I can say, go in Jesus name. Some people are able to do that and some people aren't. But you need to get used to doing that. We're allowed to. But, but the peace of God, you say, God, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling like a spiritual giant at the moment. But Lord, just let me feel your peace. Nine times out of ten, if not always, God's peace will descend on you. And so just, I want to conclude in a minute, but just go over that. Right? John 14, 15 to 28, goes on because the first bit, John 14, 1 to 14, talks about salvation, talks about Jesus, you know, J-E-S-U-S, justifies, equips, sustains, understands, sends, talks about how to get saved and everything else. But he goes in this little bit here, and he talks about, he talks again about the Holy Spirit, that you can have this incredible third person of the Godhead dwelling in you. And you can invite him in as a Christian. And as a result, you can know that you know that you know that you know that you know that God's real, that heaven's real, you're going to heaven, that nothing you've done wrong disqualifies you from there if you've got faith in Jesus, although he calls us to live a holy life. But that's as he works with us. You can know that he can work through you in power. You know that he can... I just want to give you... Um, no, I'll leave that until next week. It's a, a, a kind of a second-hand testimony. But I'll, 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 I need to sort of confirm it first. Um, but, but, but God can work through us in power. So that starts with the Holy Spirit. He says, and he says you can have the Holy Spirit. Without God, um, we are orphans. However, and he says, just look, you know... Concentrate on the humble. But he reminds us again that God's Spirit and the presence of God's Spirit can be felt by us and in Christ we can have peace. We can have absolutely have peace inside all the time. And I want to read, finish with 2 Peter 1 verses 3 to 8 just to, just to connect with this. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will not... It's missing off of this. This is a technology. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 8. I do apologise. Let me find it again. It's missing off the bottom. 2 Peter 1, 3 to 8. Um, they'll, not, they'll keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want a discipleship course, read stuff like that in the Bible. There's a million, a mil- a m- 10,000 million great books about Christianity. Yes, read them, but read the Bible as well. So I want to leave that right now. We'll just, I just want to conclude and we'll maybe just be silent for a moment and let the worship band come back. In that passage of Scripture, God reminds us, yes, we've got to live a holy life, but it's not something we can do on our own. God looks at you and says, God looks at you and says, look, I know you don't think you're like anybody else. I know you have problems in your brain or in your work or in your temptations that are to- you think are totally different to everybody else. But at the end of the day, we're all the same. And Jesus died on the cross to remind you that you are forgiven, you are redeemed, God's got a plan for your life, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell with you and help you with absolutely everything you're going through. The Holy Spirit can help you if you're worried or worried if you're being bullied, if you're in fear, temptation, lack of assurance for heaven. Any of these things, he can come in and be with you right now. Absolutely. And the Holy Spirit is powerful. You know, he, he Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the one, the three, they're the same. They're all, they're all, all part of God. And they get that out of the Bible. It's great. It's lovely. It's fantastic. And, and I just want to basically encourage you with that fact today. And simply, it's just the one thing that God's saying to me right now, that just to remind you all how much God loves you, don't feel bad that you're humble. I'm humble as well, you know. Mike Pelavachi said something once, and I'll leave it here now, and we're going to let these guys speak. And this is great. And he broke something. He broke something across the world um, in the youth movement. He broke something in my brain as well. And everything. Now, Mike Pulavachi is the, is the leader of Soul Survivor. Now, Soul Survivor is a brilliant sort of summer festival, Christian, you know, youth conference and stuff. We've taken the youth groups from here, there and everything. And he stood up, and obviously he's single. He's, he's, he's about 55. He says, once I stood up in front of a load of boys, he said, and you could tell that every one of them was trying to be like Jack the Lad and stuff. And they're all Christians. And he says, I've got something to tell you. He says, I am 55 years old and I've never, ever, ever slept with anybody in my life, animal, vegetable, min- mineral. He says, and do you know what? I feel okay. He says, I've got nothing to brag about. And they all, they all burst into tears and give him a standing ovation. He says, and he says, what I'm saying to you is this. However you are, however humble you are, God can work with it. Don't try to be like Mr. Superstar. Everything you've been through, God says, okay, I know you've got it but the Holy Spirit can help you. And what Mike was simply saying is, look, God's given me, he's basically taken a vow of celibacy because God's told him to do that, which is great, and loads of people have. But the Holy Spirit, you know, rem- reminds you of the fact that as you are, he will work with you and he will use you for his glory. God bless you. Thank you.